The Smithsonian Faculty Fellowship Program represents a rewarding academic professional development opportunity for faculty at Montgomery College. The fellowships are a product of a unique collaboration between Montgomery College and the Smithsonian Center for Learning and Digital Access. It's the first of its kind between the Smithsonian Institution and a community college. Sonia Fisher is an associate professor in the School of Education. She earned her BA and MED from the University of Virginia. Before coming to Montgomery College, she taught in public and private schools and established an academic therapy tutoring service for students with learning disabilities. Her next project is developing a pilot program using a virtual classroom with pre-service teachers to simulated teaching challenges. In a virtual classroom, students try different strategies and interventions, get immediate feedback, and try revised strategies. Outside of Montgomery College, she volunteers as a court-appointed special advocate for children. She enjoys reading poetry and fiction, studying Spanish, playing racquetball, and backpacking. I teach education courses at the Germantown campus, and the particular class I used my fellowship experience with was Intro to Special Education. This is an upper division class, so everybody in the class has already determined they want to teach. So these are people who want to teach early childhood, elementary, or secondary. This was a group of 20, and it was really diverse in terms of age, ethnicity, um, language, lots of factors. This was just a wordle we created the first day when we began talking about the fellowship. So these were some of their reactions to why might you go to a museum, what do you think of museums. I wanted to cover quickly a couple of key course concepts just to give you a little background. Um, the students in 201 study how education wasn't just given to people with disabilities. They had to fight for it, and so we look at that history of civil efforts to bring about change and to have educational justice. A second key concept, though, is universal design. We do have laws. We have ADA, you're probably familiar with, and we have the IDEA, which guarantees students' rights. But the focus is really on a few students with significant disabilities. And the movement in education is to begin to think about all of the variability in all of our students, and that we create better classrooms when we change our focus in that way. So this is just a quick review of what ADA covers. Most people are familiar that um, it's covering these areas. And the point of it really is to um, bring people into the public sphere to make sure there aren't barriers to participation in society, uh, work, employment, um, public accommodations, et cetera. The Individuals with Disabilities Act was passed in 75 and it's the foundation for all of special education. It's a very complicated law, but in the same way, ADA tried to bring all disabilities into um, the community and the public sphere. IDEA did the same in education, and it was to make sure that children with disabilities had the most normal experience of school possible. Um, and so we want them in neighborhood schools, we want them in general education, typical classes, if at all possible. So how is universal design different than meeting the needs of special ed students? And I promise this is the end of the lecture. <laughs> um, universal, does, excuse me, universal design focuses less on a few students' deficits, and it shifts that focus. So teachers are trying to reach all learners through their abilities. So it's a very positive focus, and teachers are thinking about what are some multiple ways I can push out the information I need to and then looking at the talents and abilities of my students, how can they show what they know? Um, and of course, motivation and self-regulation are important skills that the students need as well. So how does this fit with the theme? <laughs> Ingenuity, innovation. Um, I see a connection because um, while museums and schools have different roles and different structures and all of that, I do think that there's some shared aspects too. Obviously, they're um, educational in focus. And I do think that they're also all confronting this idea of how do we bring in different audiences? How do we meet the needs of different kinds of learners? Um, so I thought it was a good experience, and uh, we actually had an amazing time. 
All right, we just did a couple of activities in the classroom to warm up. Um, these were actually activities we did in the fellowship group. I'm not going to give anything away for the new group, but <laughs> I promise, Sarah. Um, but what was cool about this was how my, my students received this. Um, you know, lectures, textbooks, tests um, really reward a certain kind of thinking and a certain kind of academic ability, and that's great. We need to keep doing that. Um, but the object-based learning approach really causes you to slow down, and I think our students really need to slow down. They're in a fast-paced world. They operate at lightning speed. And my students didn't like these activities at first. And then the comments I got afterward were that their understanding of the, the assignment deepened. Um, they heard from different classmates who didn't usually talk. And these are exactly the outcomes we're looking for in the classroom. So it's great for my teacher, my future teachers, to experience that themselves and to get some tools for doing that in their future classrooms. So our first stop was the National Gallery, the Portrait Gallery. And we visited three portraits. The George Washington Carver portrait is the one you saw on the last slide. But we also uh, were going specifically because there's um, an exhibit there called The Struggle for Justice, and disability rights and activism were part of that. And so we looked at the Christopher Reeves um, portrait and also Eunice Shriver, who started the Special Olympics. Um, you can see the Christopher Reeve portrait in the back. It's really powerful. And this is Brianna White. She's an amazing art educator and really talked with my students a lot about how to use art to teach history. So it was a great opportunity for them to learn some new techniques. Um, after that, we had a good day, so we stopped at the Sculpture Garden, and uh, we kind of used the skills we had just learned from Brianna, walking around, you know, what, how would you teach about that sculpture in the background? So we, we <laughs> talked about those kinds of things. Um, and we also looked at it uh, from the point of view, if you had kids with mobility issues, how would you navigate the space? Were there places you couldn't access? Um, so we were just sort of doing some on-the-fly practice. We then went to the National Museum of American History. So this is Ashley Grady, and there's a tiny office at the Smithsonian. I think it's only two full-time people, and Ashley Grady's one of them, uh, to help the Smithsonian uh, think about access and um, bringing new populations in. And this is some of my students in the Spark Lab. So I just want to focus on three programs that she talked about. There were others, um, but these were um, interesting to my students. The Spark Lab, again, this lower picture uh, is the same space. You're used to hands-on exhibits for <coughs> children, and it is that kind of space. But what was interesting to me and to my students was how much they're starting to think about students with um, sensory impairments and intellectual impairments. And they are really going through a process of redesigning a lot of aspects um, of that Spark Lab. Um, so in this picture above, you can see a person who has a visual impairment touching a sculpture. They are allowed to touch the art. <laughs> um, even paintings, if you think about it, a, um, something like a pastel or a watercolor is going to feel very different than um, an oil painting, or a Rembrandt might feel very different than a Titian. So they get that experience uh, on these curated tours. Um, and the last one was so fascinating to my students. There's a program that's run out of that office called Project Search. Um, students who are between 19 and 21 with autism or other developmental disabilities can apply. It's very competitive. It's a year-long internship, and to date, about 20 young people who have gone through that program have been hired by the Smithsonian. So it's a very practical, get real skills and um, become part of the community in that very inclusive way. So I wanted to end by telling you a little bit about a couple of my student projects. I know the picture to the left probably looks like a mess, but <laughs> this is a tactile interpretation of a photograph. So my student was imagining um, a history um, module or lesson and wanted to get across the idea that cars were very different a long time ago. And so she took 
uh, leather from a belt to create the seats. She used tin foil to um, indicate where the metal parts would be. The size of the wheels obviously are very different compared to the carriage. So you'd get a lot of information if you were a child, uh, a student with visual impairments. And I love the fact that she included rocks. I would not have thought of that, but roads were very rocky then and, and not comfortable. <laughs> so anyhow, um, all of the projects were great. The one on the right turned into a bigger project because of the efforts of one student. So this is Robbie Oland, and um, he didn't like this map that we had on the website. Uh, one of the options students have was to look at a public space and make recommendations for how to make it more accessible. And so he started with Montgomery College. <laughs> and he said that when he was a student, he drove by and he didn't know where to park and he didn't know what was what and he almost left. And uh, he thought that was a bad way to start. So this is what he did with it. And we were really impressed. Um, he blew up the center section so that it's more readable. He took out some of the visual clutter and by color coding it, he envisioned this system where you could stand in the middle of campus and there would be banners, and these are just samples here on the right, on each building. So when you're standing there, you can orient yourself. It's awesome, right? <laughs> yeah, I about fell over. It was so awesome. Um, what was really wonderful out of that experience was the students in the class started talking about their experience of our campus. Where were the spaces they didn't like to be? It turns out in the HS building where I teach, the upstairs is very smelly from the basement mm -hmm. um, where the food is cooked. And, <laughs> and what was wonderful is um, everybody put their ideas together. Robbie decided to continue with this and to polish it all up and put these ideas together. Um, and he made a report, I guess I didn't have a, another picture, he made a report to the provost vice president at Germantown, Margaret Latimer, and she took over an hour to go through the report with Robbie and to look at his ideas. Um, it was a really uh, wonderful opportunity for him, and I think she really did feel like he had touched on some legitimate problems that needed to be addressed and was taking it very seriously. So. I'm into 201 for the spring semester and we're preparing to go to the Smithsonian. We're gonna have a couple of different experiences than last time. Because it's our second time around, you can tweak things. My students are gonna be able to meet some of those project search interns and we're really looking forward to that. And they're gonna take an insight tour. So I don't know what I'm gonna to get to touch, but I'm very excited. <laughs> Thank you.